Hey guys, it's been a while since I've done one of these videos. I wanted to discuss with you a little bit about the food crisis, the food crisis that really hasn't even set in compared to where it's headed next year. There are a lot of people who are still in denial about this. It's not their fault. A lot of the reporting that they've seen, a lot of the information that they have been given has been piecemealed to them, or you know, it's, it's not something that people really retain. So in this video, I'm gonna cover a lot of this information cover a lot of key points and hopefully help you guys understand the gravity of the situation that we're headed into. Um, I just got done traveling across the U.S. filming. Uh, we, we work with a lot of uh, small farms. Well, I don't say just small farms, but um, farms and ranches across the United States. And um, one of the things that we kept hearing and, and was very noticeable on our drive was the condition of a lot of the crops across the United States. As you know, this year we've had a severe drought, which has had a dramatic impact on crops across the United States. Um, but one of the concerns that I have had and that I've mentioned on this channel over and over again, and I said, when we get to September, watch for the, uh, the September USDA reports because they're going to change everything. And, and we've seen that happen. But uh, when we were out West, for example, we kept hearing from numerous farmers that the USDA uh, reports on stockpiles had to have been wrong at the end of 2021. Um, and the reason for that is when you look at uh, the, the cash bases for corn purchases as the harvest is coming in, normally what you have is you have a lot of grains in the stockpiles. And so you'll see the cash bases a lot lower than the future prices of corn. The futures are what you see traded on the um, on the Chicago Exchange, and and instead, what we're seeing this year is we're seeing the cash base is much higher. You know, where corn is currently around seven dollars on the December contracts, we're actually seeing it on the cash bases uh, corn going for about eight dollars or or more on average out west. It's been about forty cents higher than the futures price. Uh, a little when you head east, it's a little different, but the East Coast has had. Uh, slightly better crops the last two years, um, but we're really looking at our impacts from the drought, which is now going on to its third year. Um, I don't know how we're going to survive a third year based on what we've seen as far as crop losses this year. And it's just kind of been a compounding issue because you've got this drought slowly expanding. Anyway, but the reason why the cash basis bids are so high and why they're over the futures prices is because the grain bins are empty out west. The grain bins are empty, which means that the stockpiles that were presumed to be there by the USDA last year were incorrect. And if you look at the USDA report from September 30th, they actually did adjust those numbers down. They were still, you know, about 1.7% higher than the year before, but they did adjust them down. Uh, and I think they're, they're going to have to make further adjustments. I've talked about this on this channel for years. Every September, you see this cut on uh, stockpiles, and that's because it becomes harder and harder to hide, especially when you have a cash, ba cash basis bid so much higher than the futures contracts. So that is something that you should all be concerned about. The grain shortage that is coming is going to be severe. Driving through Kansas, most of Kansas, most of the corn crops in Kansas were toast. Um, th there was nothing there. When you get into states like Missouri, I think Missouri is looking at a 30% decline in, um, in new stockpiles this year. So there, there are definitely some major cuts going through this, this year's harvest season um, and those stockpiles were completely diminished out west. The bins were empty. Farmers were bidding up above um, futures contracts to get grains back in their bins so that they could feed cattle over the winter and, um, and whatnot. So uh, this is something that I hope you guys are paying attention to and that you're, you're starting to see, it, you know, see what's going to be happening in 2023 and preparing yourself now. So I wanted to bring up several different points uh, for those who have completely missed uh, some of the activities of the past year. And hopefully, you know, some of these key points to our food supply will help you help register for you what's happening out there. The red winter wheat crop this year was the worst that it's been since 1963. It was a very, very small winter wheat crop. The difference though between 1963 and today is that back in 1963, there were only 182 million people in the United States. Today, there are over 329 million people. So we've had the population nearly double since the 1960s, but we're seeing the worst uh, winter wheat crop 
that we had seen since that time frame. And this year is not gonna be any different. The drought conditions out west uh, have continued to uh, gain momentum as we go into a third year of La Nina. So winter wheat this year is going to probably be just as bad as last year, if not worse. I think that as these conditions continue to compound, what you have to realize is that it's compounding on the soil as well. That soil is getting drier and drier. It's getting harder and harder to grow on. Rice crop in California is projected to be about 50% of what it was last year. Uh, this is a lot to do with the drought conditions again, but we're looking at a 50% decrease in rice production out of California this year. Looking at something like a tomato harvest, uh, the tomato harvest in the United States this year is estimated to be about 10.5 million tons. That's a, a million tons less tomatoes this year than an average year. I started out talking about corn. The thing about corn is that this year's corn crop is expected to be the worst that it's been in a decade. In fact, if you look at fresh corn shipments across the United States this year, it was down 20%. Another uh, crop that was down significantly this year in shipments were carrots. Carrots were down 45% this year. We talked about the potato shortage. Uh, the potatoes were year-to-date shipments were down 13%. Celery shipments down 11%. Total peach production in the United States was down 15% this year. I mean, these are all significant numbers. Three quarters of the farmers in the United States. So you're talking 75% most farmers in the United States say that the drought conditions are impacting their crops. They're impacting their income, they're impacting their crops. The drought hasn't just taken its toll on crops either. If you look at the cattle industry, and I'm gonna uh, address the bison industry too, because I think that uh, these two industries have both suffered significantly. But if you look at the cattle industry, the total number of cattle in Oregon is down 41%. The number of cattle in New Mexico is down 43%. This is because these cows have been harvested and, and their, their, their herds reduced in size because of the drought conditions. They can't get water, they can't get grains. In Texas, cattle, uh, cattle are down over 50%. Um, there's actually some farmers predicting that ground beef prices could go up to $50 a pound. That's a significant amount of money that people would have to pay for ground beef. Why? Because we've harvested all the beef this year. The, the, the ranches have had to cut back on their herd sizes so much, it will take several years to get their herd sizes back up to where they used to be. And the bison industry, as I mentioned, is kind of facing the same scenario. We've gone to ranches this year where they've gone from about 4,000 head of bison down about 50% to about 2,500 head of bison. And they've done that because of the drought conditions. The, the grasses are growing slower. They have to manage their land. If they can't feed the animals, they can't hang on to them. And so they're predicting that uh, within two years, you're gonna see a bison meat shortage. And that the reason why there's a, a time frame there from when we go through this mass production phase and then when we can start seeing the actual shortages hit the shelves is because um, right now you're harvesting a lot more beef and, and bison and meat than you would normally harvest to try and reduce the herd sizes to save yourself from drought. That's, a, that's flooding the markets with more meat than what would typically be on the markets. And as you know, the way supply and demand works is that when supply hits harder, um, the, the cost of things go down against the, the demand line. Um, demand has actually been going up, which is why you haven't really necessarily seen a price break at the grocery stores because the demand is actually rising each year. And so what's scary is that we're actually over harvesting this year, prices are still going up. When you, when you do the math and you really put this all together, over the next couple years, when there's a supply glut because of what we've gone through this year, and if, if this current La Nina trend continues uh, far enough into next year, we could see it continue into next year. Um, but when you, when you see how this system works, within the next year or two, you're gonna start seeing those shortages on the shelves. And when those shortages hit the shelves, the prices are going to skyrocket. And it's gonna take years, years to rebuild the herds to the sizes that they were. Um, in the bison industry, it could take years more than, than the cattle industry because uh, bison typically don't reach reproductive age for a couple of years. But um, we're gonna to have to see a, a major adjustment in, and I think across the board in the meat industry because of the herd size reductions this year. And next year, I think we're gonna see a lot of those herd size reductions when it comes to chickens, when it, we've, 
Well, we saw some of that this year with the bird flu um, when it comes to pigs because of the, the cost of grains. There, there literally are no grains. Like I have driven through these fields. I have driven across the West and there's, the fields are looking horrible in a lot of states. Not all, every state. I mean, there are some states that look pretty good, but um, for the most part, I mean, when you consider how much grain it takes, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of crop devastation out there from the drought. This drought is the worst drought the U.S. has seen in 1,200 years. And while we're experiencing that 1,200 year drought here, Europe is also experiencing the worst drought it has seen in 500 years. They're expecting corn production in the EU to be down as much as one fifth. I mean, these aren't small numbers. When you figure a 10% decline in crop productivity uh, is, is damaging to the markets, damaging to your pocketbook, you're talking in the EU a one fifth decline in total corn production. You're talking in the United States, I think more than that. Um, the pro, uh, Pro Farmer Tour came in 10% lower than the USDA's numbers, which were adjusted lower. I mean, I think that the Pro Farmer Tour is actually going to seem pretty bullish because driving through some of those Western states, some of the states that they covered weren't that bad. They weren't that bad compared to states like Kansas. I'm pretty sure Kansas has seen close to 70% of its corn crops lost and soybeans. So overall with crop losses in France, they're expecting about 35% crop losses. In other areas of the United Kingdom, they're expecting as much as 50% crop losses. And the, the other problem that you have over there in Europe is that they've gone to this green indoor farming where they've been able to grow a lot of plants and, and vegetables inside. Um, and that industry has also been shut down due to the high uh, cost of uh, gas and, and and the energy that it requires to operate those indoor greenhouses. I mean, the, the concept was if we grow inside, we have a controlled environment, we're not polluting, it's better for the earth, and now they're getting shut down because the energy costs are so high. Um, there, the, you, when you look at, there was a bakery that I read about in Europe that got a $300,000 gas bill in one month. The, the, the prices of energy, um, in Europe right now are absolutely insane and they are shutting down farmers left and right. They're shutting down indoor farms left and right. That's not a solution. I don't know why anybody thought that would ever be a good solution, but <laughs> they're shutting them down. They, they have no choice. You can't grow food in those environments for the cost of, of what it takes to grow them, for the cost of the energy. And I think that's, we're going to start seeing a lot of that too when it comes to harvest time, you know, whether or not farmers can justify the cost of energy to go out and harvest their own fields. Uh, there are parts of Germany that they're expecting about 50% crop losses in. Italy is already reporting 80, up to 80% crop losses in some areas. Kind of heading over into some of those third world countries where um, a, a large percentage of the population has already been suffering uh, severely from uh, starvation and hunger. Um, this is what I've said on, our, on these videos several times in the past. We are a rich country. We tend to outbid some of those poorer countries. And so you don't feel necessarily the food crisis here because you know the big, the big chains are all buying grains from wherever they can get them around the globe, shipping them here, turning them into products, putting them on the shelves for you. But other countries are starving. Other countries are, are having major issues. And then when you look at a place like Somalia, they're expected to have about an 80% decrease in crops this year alone. That's an 80% decrease in feeding their people. And they, they, they're, they're not able to outbid countries like the United States for some of these grains that go on the market. I mean, they're in a very hopeless, dire situation. We've seen in places like Iran and other countries around the world where you've started to see um, some revolt and, and retaliation because of food prices, energy prices, food shortages. And I think that you're gonna start seeing that spread faster and faster around some of these third world countries. Africa has lost at least 7 million livestock animals this year due to drought conditions. China is facing the worst drought in, rec in their recorded history as well. Um, and in fact, China has got a meat supply issue uh, they have dipped into their strategic pork reserves 
the most they ever have to try and keep prices down because prices were getting out of control. So there are significant food shortages in China. China is not one of those countries when they get into a food shortage situation that you wanna get in the way of. I talked about California rice a few minutes ago. When you look at uh, rice in India, India produces 40% of the global rice trade around the world. And they're expecting to have significant losses this year. Um, they're not expected to produce nearly as much rice as they normally do, or any crops for that matter. And then there's been this, um, this livestock disease in India that's been killing off a lot of cattle. Um, this is why it's important for us to know as U.S. consumers where our meat is coming from because we don't know, you know, what sick animal it came from when it's coming from some of these places overseas. But there have been a lot of uh, diseases going on in India this year as well. I'm not sure exactly. I'll have to do a little more research on that situation out there, but they have lost a lot of livestock as well. You know, we're not just talking about droughts here. We're also talking about flooding situations in Pakistan. A, 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 good portion of the country has been underwater and floods and almost all of Pakistan's crops have been washed away this year. I think the exact estimates of crop losses in Pakistan are 80 to 90 percent. This is unfathomable when you have countries reporting 50 to 90 percent crop losses around the world. This is the type of stuff that I have been warning you guys about for several years now. It's all happening. Just because you don't see it at the grocery store yet does not mean that it is not happening right now. What you're eating in the grocery store was grown last year. So when you put all this together, you know, you've got uh, the UN warning that there's going to be multiple famines in 2023. And it, it, these are, it, it's pretty obvious. We can see where the famines are already happening. There, it would not surprise me that we see significant food shortages here in the United States. There was a recent survey that said, that uh, grocery shoppers in the United States, the, the amount of credit, personal credit being used to buy groceries has gone up 95%. That means that people are buying more and more groceries on credit card. Um, the cost of fertilizer continues to be out of hand and going higher. The World Food Program is saying 828 million people, that's nearly one eighth of our planet, is going to be having uh, is going to be going to bed hungry in 2023, and I think that number is actually going to be a lot higher. I think we're, we're I think we're looking at about 25% of the population of this planet in 2023 at some point having food shortage issues. So, guys, these are real issues. These aren't things that were caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If you noticed, I didn't even address the grain situation coming out of Ukraine. That's another uh, one of those uh, one of those issues that have come up over the past year that are causing food shortages for everybody. That's causing a lot of energy shortages. I guess I brought that up a little bit with um, the energy crisis in Europe. Um, luckily, we're, we're selling as much of our oil overseas as we possibly can to help everybody out. But my point is, is that this is a global crisis that's hitting everybody. Um, and I, the reason why I've been warning about this for several years is because not because of climate change. Um, the climate does change constantly. A lot of people call me a climate denier. I, I don't deny that the climate changes regularly. Um, but with the patterns that I've seen, the natural patterns of our climate cycles and where they've been heading over the past couple of years, it would appear that um, what we're seeing now is only the beginning of a longer trend, a longer trend that's gonna last for a longer period of time. And if we can't make it past this year, with growing crops, I mean, we've our stockpiles were wiped out last year. That's why out west you're seeing the cash basis bid so much higher than the futures contracts. And I think if you look across the board at several other crops, you're going to see similarities there. Once we run out of the stockpiles, once we run out of the pre-made pre preserved foods that we've had, um, the, the situation is going to snowball more and more out of control. We're already seeing numbers being adjusted on a regular basis to the downside. Um, the, the thing that worries me is that there's going to be another type of distraction, you know, whether that's the, the war with Ukraine getting more out of control. I think Dr. Dr. Fauci said the other day that there could be a, a COVID uh, virus this winter that would be worse and more deadly than the one before. There's gonna be some sort of distraction to keep us distracted from coming to terms with the reality of what's going on out there. 
the only way that you can really avoid being impacted by these this coming food crisis is to in some way supplement your food with food that you can grow on your own. Um, and, I, and this is probably the most important thing everybody could possibly do right now is figure out a way to grow food. Even if you live in an apartment, grow th some things on your balcony. I actually have met people who have run small farming operations out of, out of an apartment enough uh, with enough produce to actually take to a farmer's market and sell it. So there are ways that you can create food regardless of where you are. You don't need a ton of land. Anything that you can grow to help offset your grocery bill is going to save you with hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is coming. And, and if you've noticed, we've been, um, we've been kind of dipping into a recession. Price of, prices have still been going higher. Um, this is the type of stagflation, hyperinflation that I've been warning about on this channel all year, well, the last two years. Um, so grow some food, grow some food to cut back on your grocery bill grow some food to make sure you don't go hungry or, or end up starving. Um, we've heard a lot of people talking about synthetic foods over the past couple of years, the development of those foods. We know that the United States government has worked on programs through DARPA to develop food from waste, 3D printed food, and make it tasty and tolerable. Um, that is for the event that we are out of food. So it's been pretty obvious that there is a food crisis coming and what the alternatives to eating real food are. Um, and they're not necessarily good. They're not fantastic for you. We've also learned a lot of things about synthetic foods and, and how bad they actually could be for you. But when there is no other alternative, um, you know, at the end of the day, the government's going to try and supply people with something. And, and the other part of that is controlling food production, food trade to make sure that um, things are fair, so to speak. So that I think it could impact a lot of you who are able to grow your own foods, you, you know, the rights to do that, your food sovereignty in and of itself could be threatened as we head deeper into this crisis. But if everybody started working now to try and grow some food, um, I think that a lot of it could be averted, but it, it's, you know, how do you convince a bunch of people who could hear everything that I've just said on, on, on here today, which isn't even including, you know, the, the, the food facility fires and things like that. It, they've, they've heard all of these things. They've seen it on the news. They've, they've gotten pieces of the information. Maybe it hasn't all been laid out to them all at once, but how do you convince them to go out and grow food when they're still not convinced that there's a food crisis, that there's a food shortage. Next year is going to be the worst that we've ever seen. If people don't start taking actions over the winter time, preparing for the spring to get these things in the ground, by the summertime, there's gonna be a lot of starving people even here in the United States. Um, there's just not enough grains. As we head into this third year of La Nina, um, we're gonna start seeing those impacts again in South America. There is not gonna be a good crop for anybody that's going to lift the world up and help us move forward. I mean, it's just, it's not there. It's not in the near future. Um, and like I said, I think that these patterns are going to continue for uh, quite some time when it comes to the weather. I think that there is a natural cycle that we've seen before, which is why we've seen this drought 1200 years ago, which is why Europe has seen this type of drought 500 years ago. And I think that these conditions could last for quite some time before they actually improve. Um, it's rare that you see a th third year of La Nina back to back like we're seeing now. It's happened before about a century ago. It hasn't happened uh, in the last hundred years. So that should tell you something as well. These are patterns that repeat themselves. The way I could describe what we're heading into is kind of like the severity of all of these patterns uh, combined. Now, if you're somebody who's concerned about global warming or you know, you're focused on all of those other things that you think is causing you know, all of this, I would encourage you to actually research some of those cycles and maybe, you know, who knows, somebody can, can research the you know, real natural cycles and, and plug in you know, CO2 into the model and see what happens. It might you know, go straight up. Anyway, get out there and, and start to grow something. Start stocking up on seeds now because there's going to there's gonna be a shortage by the time we get to the spring. Heirloom seeds are the way to go. Um, the reason why you want heirloom seeds is that because that seed has had 25 generations before it 
of proven cycles, which means that your chances of crop losses with heirloom seeds are actually much lower. That and those seeds are more likely to be able to produce a, a new generation of seeds, unlike you know some other seeds, some of the the non heirloom seeds. So um, there are a lot of things that I you know I don't spend enough time talking about what you can do to prep on this channel. Part of that's because of you know the amount of work that we have to do, but there are a lot of things that you can be doing, and um, I, you know, if there's a way that you can start convincing those around you to do the same, do it because it's better for all of us. The, the less people there are walking around ready to eat somebody else, uh, the better off we're going to be. So the more people that we can help understand that there is a major food crisis, um, this is something that's come straight from the UN, there will be multiple famines in 2023. Some of those famines I think are going to impact the Western world. I don't think we're gonna be as far removed from it in 2023 as we have been in 2022 and 2021. It has reached full circle in the countries that um, if, when you look around the world and you start seeing these thir third world countries um, go into more and more you know, revolts and, and retaliations over things like the cost of energy and the cost of food, you'll start to see that spewing over until you get into some of the larger countries, some of the richer countries. Um, China, like I said, is, is in dire straits right now. They've been tapping into their pork reserves. They've been facing one of the worst droughts they ever have. Um, and when that happens, China's gonna start looking for resources elsewhere and they've got enough power to do it. So um, these are all things that we should be concerned about as we go into the end of this year, we start planning for next year. Think about it, don't be an idiot. Don't, <laughs> don't look around at the grocery store and say, oh, there's no food shortage, you're full of BS. I'm not full of BS. It's here.